Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to our talk about uh, Everest. Uh, I am Pete. This is Kai. Uh, we are both uh, software developers at the company Pionix, uh, who initiated the Everest project. Um, and yeah, we are really excited to present it here. Um, so Everest is in uh, a software stack for charging infrastructure for electric vehicles. Um, but before we dig deeper into what Everest is and uh, what it can do, I would like you uh, to give you a quick introduction into yeah how to charge how to technically charge a car and uh, you should think charging a car is easy right you just uh, plug it in um, plug it in on your vehicle side on your charging station side and it should uh, just start to charge but uh, unfortunately this isn't always the case um, let's have a look on how charging how easy charging really is. So um, what you can see here is an overview um, of the ecosystem um, of the charging infrastructure that evolved um, over the last 10 to 15 years, I'd say. Um, so there's a lot of players around, um, a lot of charging station manufacturers, cloud operators, charge point manufacturers and stuff like that. And uh, today we're going to focus on uh, this little box here, which basically covers, um, yeah, mainly the communication um, that uh, that the charging station has to maintain or for which is it is responsible for. Um, so you can see um, what is necessary to to build the charging station, what kind of communication is necessary for that. Um, so on the following slides, I will show you a little bit about the protocols that you can see here. Um, to show you yeah, what, what a charger needs to do or what you need to do when you want to build a charger. Um, so let's dive into it. What, what do you need to charge your car? You basically need a charging station, which usually consists of uh, a control unit, so a small embedded Linux device, for example, uh, and some power, power electronic paths. Um, and then, of course, you need the car and you establish uh, a data link and, and a power link. And speaking of power, there can be different like types of, of of power. You can do AC charging with uh, different voltage levels. You can uh, charge on on one, three, or even two phases, um, and you can charge with different with different currents. You can also do DC charging, which is usually a lot faster than AC charging, and usually also more expensive because of um, the bigger power electronics part um, and stuff like that. But you can also think about inductive charging. So there are many different ways that you can use to charge your electric vehicle, many different yeah, um, types that you can use there. And where it gets really interesting is when you think about the data link. Um, there is, um, um, there are, well, you use this data link basically to communicate between the charger and your car. And the communication is not the same for AC and DC charging, for example, and there are also like different communication standards for AC charging, for DC charging, and for different types of AC and DC charging. So when we start with AC charging, you usually use this kind of plug over here, the type two plug. And it's a really simple uh, pulse width modulation that you use there um, to communicate from the charging station to your electric vehicle. Um, and you exchange like a minimum data um, using that pulse width modulation, you exchange the states of your vehicle and your charger, uh, the capacity of the charging cable, and the maximum amount of current that is allowed um, to charge, for example. Um, so this basically covers AC charging. It is controlled via, via this uh, control pilot plug. So you just have one wire for that. Uh, and when we talk about DC charging, things get a little bit more complicated. Uh, you have um, different kind of standards for that. Um, the DeanSpec 70121, for example, it uses um, power line communication as well as the ISO 15118. Uh, there's also the Shademo standard, which is mainly used in, uh, in Asia. And um, I want to highlight the ISO 15118 a little bit. Um, it is yeah, quite a new standard, quite new means, I think it's from 2014 and not, not really um, implemented for most of the vehicles and most of the chargers right now. Um, but it defines a lot of more information that is exchanged between the charger and your electric vehicle 
also some really useful information like the state of charge which, which is not exchanged when you use this basic AC communication but you can imagine that you can use the state of charge of your electric vehicle for um, for a lot of stuff when you think about energy management you might want to know how full the battery of your car is to like manage the power that you um, provide um, by your charger and stuff like that um, and there are also a lot a lot of security considerations that are specified in this ISO 15.11.8. Uh, you have to implement it on both sides, so it's a specification for the charger and the car, but it's not really implemented by a lot of vehicles and a lot of chargers right now. And the reason for it is that it is a standard that um, is quite complex. There is uh, There are a lot of uh, different versions of it, and there's a lot of room for interpretations and Every car manufacturer and every charging station manufacturer has to implement this, the standard. And when all of them do it in different ways, this leads to incompatibilities um, and to bad user experience be because oftentimes charging often doesn't just work um, using this ISO 15.11.8. And this is why many chargers still stick to the DeanSpec 70121, for example, for DC charging or the, the IEC uh, 61851. And the ISO 15.11.8 is not only for DC charging, it's for, it's for AC and DC charging. Um, right. So this was like mainly the communication between the charger and your um, electric vehicle. But there's another important link when you think about public charging infrastructure you need some cloud communication from your charger to the cloud. You want to monitor your charger, you want to transmit transaction-related data, for example, um, for payment and billing services and stuff like that. Um, and the protocol that is mainly used for this communication is um, the Open Charge Point protocol, um, which is an application layer protocol on top of WebSocket. Um, and it is used for monitoring, for, for service, for remote control of your charging station, um, for remote starts, for example, when you stand in front of a charging station and you, you want to use your mobile, fan, uh, your mobile phone or the app of, of your mobility service provider to start a transaction. Um, what you talk to the backend system there is OCPP when you start your transaction, for example. Um, it's also out there in different versions, so currently in uh, mostly used in ver with version 1.6, um, but 2.0 is already published. 2.0 covers a lot of the stuff that is specified in the ISO 15.11.8, but this is also the reason why it is not used um, in many charges and vehicles right now, because uh, if no one Im has implemented the ISO 15.11.8 stuff, you don't need 2.0 at the moment, and 1.6 is enough for, for what the charges and vehicles can right now. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't really end here. Um, uh, there is also cloud communication uh, happening between yeah, like different clouds if, you're, um, if you want to charge your car and your operator does not know the, the, your contract or your identifier, you have to establish some communication between clouds so that you can also um, charge if your operator does not know your ID tag, for example, so for interoperability. And also the OSPP standard is also quite... Um, or has also quite some room for interpretations. Every charging station manufacturer has to implement it. There are different um, yeah, backend systems out there with their own uh, implementations. And it leads to the fact that many backend systems have to implement like special solutions for special chargers or they have to, um, they have to test with every charger, although it's the same protocol, but um, there's so much room and um, yeah, so many uh, different dialects out there and that, that makes it really hard. Um, on top of that, um, there is a feature which is called plug and charge. This is also covered in OSPP 2.0 and um, the ISO 15.11.8, which should be there for a while. So um, people are saying it will be here uh, in two years ever since, um, since 2014, um, but still no, one, no one's really using it. Um, and that leads to the fact that there is yeah, there are mechanisms out there like auto charge that just uses um, the MAC address of your vehicle uh, to authenticate. So this plug and charge feature um, is usually used for authentication so that you don't need to use your mobile app anymore and you uh, don't need to swipe a card at the charging station to, uh, to tell who you are, but your vehicle does it. And uh, yeah, things like auto charge makes it a little bit easier. It uses your MAC address 
um, of your vehicle. If it is static, it is useful. So oftentimes it just changes, so it doesn't work for all of the cars. So it's really, really complex and really a lot of standards around. What else is really important right now, but especially um, um, also in the future, will be to integrate your charging infrastructure with your local energy management system. Um, or yeah, yeah, your local system, your local grid connection point. Um, imagine you want to um, use your solar power plant um, that you have at home, and you um, yeah, probably want to charge when the sun is shining, for example, then uh, you want to control the power of your char charging station externally. Um, the same applies for bigger um, charging infrastructures with many, many charging points. Um, where you have a limited grid connection point, uh, grid connection point, limited capacity, and uh, you want to balance the amount of power that goes into your charging station. So for that, you need some kind of interface, some kind of communication. There are different um, interfaces for that out there. There is um, the Modbus protocol, for example, which is used by some of the charging stations. There's SunSpec. There's also something like EEBus, um, and it's not. Um, really unified and when you want to build such a charger you basically have to implement all of them to be compatible with different energy management systems um, that are usually part of the installations at least for bigger uh, car parks for example or for bigger charging infrastructures usually have one external controller that controls the power of all of them but of course you need an interface for that and there's more standards and more protocols and the same applies also for the grid integration when you do not think about your local grid connection point, but about the whole grid, um, it gets more and more important that we integrate the electric vehicles um, smartly into that grid. Um, and um, many people see it as a burden that so many yeah, electric vehicles are on the street right now and they are all connected to the grid. But we actually see it as a chance because, I mean, electric vehicles are flexible electrical consumers. You can control the power that they consume or Maybe in the future you can even discharge them th to support your grid. But of course you need some kind of communication for that um, in order uh, to make, make it possible for the grid operator to yeah, discharge the vehicle of your car uh, or uh, the battery of your car or um, yeah, to lower the charging power to, um, to um, um, yeah, have a more stable grid and you can use electric vehicles for that definitely. So... Yeah, to sum it up, um, it's a bit of a mess. There's no de facto standard. There are many, many links, many, many standards, many, many dialects out there. And yeah, it's even growing. Um, there will be vehicle to grid when you want to discharge your, the battery of your car to support your local system in the future. Um, there will be integration to the grid system, which will get more and more important. Um, right now, we have a high fault rate, poor user experience. Um, we have really expensive and slow development of charging infrastructures because when everything started, the charging station was really just there to like charge your car. But right now, there's more and more requirements charging stations have to fulfill, um, integrate with different systems, different backend systems, stuff like that. Um, and that is really a big problem. And like every charging station manufacturer and also every electric vehicle supplier has to implement the same stuff. And there's really a lot of out there. So. How can we fix it? We can definitely not fix it by, by adding more standards. Um, but what we want to do with Everest is we want to provide a holistic reference implementation as a de facto standard for uh, charging stations for electric vehicles. And um, this implementation should cover all of the communication that I just showed to you, which is a lot. Um, and this is basically what Everest is. Of course, we are just uh, a little piece of a bigger puzzle. We are as the Everest project, part of uh, the Linux Foundation Energy since uh, 2021. And our goal is that Everest is used by a broad community, um, especially in the last months, um, the project has really taken off um, with many projects and partnerships have uh, recently launched. Um, it is currently adopted by some charging station man manufacturers um, like Marla and Futec. Um, there are some component suppliers uh, like ChargeByte, um, which will use Everest in the future and um, will also spend a lot of their uh, code base, which was closed source in, in the past. Um, and we will integrate this into Everest as well. 
and uh, we are evaluating with Texas Instruments and Fitech how to use Everest uh, with their products and also first project with universities and research institutes have uh, kicked off. Uh, and of course, also private enthusiasts and, and hackers are welcome to contribute and um, to add new features, tests and bugs and stuff like that. And now Kai will go on and explain to you what Everest really is and how it works. Right, yeah, like uh, Pete just uh, told you, I'm gonna give you like a little overview of what uh, Everest is on the inside. So what we're aiming to do is basically write a complete uh, operating system for electric vehicle chargers, which will provide all the functionality that you need um, to build charging stations for example, for a smart home use case where you have a small AC charger at home and then you might want to do some solar integration there. Um, but we will also be so flexible that um, the same solution um, also runs well on uh, commercial DC fast chargers like you find them uh, on basically every highway now nowadays. Um, this means that we have to pretty much implement everything uh, that runs between the car and the cloud. And... Uh, do all of this so it runs on uh, pretty much any tiny uh, embedded Linux platform out there. Um, the aim is to support as many uh, uh, different hardware platforms as possible. And as Pete just teased a little bit, it's already running on over like a handful of different hardware platforms at the moment and more of them are coming. Um, all of this is uh, released with a very commercial friendly open source license, the Apache 2.0 license. and yeah, the basic idea is that uh, it's not good for the whole ecosystem that everybody has to reinvent the wheel and reimplement all these protocols all the time. So basically the boring part, uh, what you actually want to do if you want to build a charging station is um, you want to build on a good foundation and then maybe add some unique features on top of that. And that is basically what we are um, providing with Everest. Um, so how is it built up on the inside? It's a very modular architecture. So it's kind of like a microservices architecture, we have uh, modules that all run as uh, individual Linux processors and uh, these modules can then expose interfaces on an MQTT bus. Uh, they can also require interfaces of other modules and um, we use a config file, like a central module config file um, to yeah, configure the dependencies of these modules and how they are connected. But you'll see that in a minute. Um, the beauty of using MQTT for the inter-process communication is also that you can quite trivially uh, run these modules on different uh, computers and just let them uh, communicate on the network, which might get interesting if you do things like uh, yeah, energy management, where this is might, might be even like not located in the same like unit of your uh, charger. Um, so uh, we build a whole framework around this, which we call the Everest framework. And this does all the uh, MQTT abstraction and takes care of uh, yeah, starting, stopping modules and uh, provides a lot of like convenience functionality that you need, uh, like logging, etc. cetera. So. Uh, a central thing is this uh, module config file. This is a JSON file that you can use to define which modules you want to load and um, it's kind of like a representation of the hardware. Um, yeah, this image here isn't really meant to be readable. It's just there so you can see what kind of modules or um, yeah, what host of modules you actually need to implement such a charging station. And yeah, an example is if you want to build a, a charging box with, for example, like two charging connectors, you can just load the charging core modules like twice and then you decide, hey, I want to add some OCPP connectivity. You just add the OCPP module there and then Maybe you want to do some, uh, yeah, some energy uh, management, and you add that on top as well. So, okay, to make this uh, configuration super easy, we also built a little web application. So you can see on the left side uh, a list of all the available modules. You can drag them into this canvas and then, yeah, modify the configuration of them. And uh, yeah do some drag and drop between the modules and connect their, uh, yeah, connect their interfaces together. And then you can just hit uh, the save button on the bottom and Everest will be restart and you can just uh, configure your box like that. So 
what are some of the typical modules that you find on the inside? Um, the most important ones are in the charging core. We call this the EVSE manager. This is a central module that basically owns a charging port and the whole charging session with a car. Um, so it knows when uh, the charging session started, when you plugged in your car, and it knows when it ended, when you plugged out your car, and yeah, everything that happened in between, like how many kilowatt hours were charged, and all of those things. And yeah, it also manages all these uh, interactions with the different norms that we touched on earlier. So if you do like this basic signaling uh, with a PWM signal on the control wire, we do this, or we also support like the high level communication with an uh, ethernet link on top of this uh, control pilot wire with the um, ISO 15118 and DIN spec. All right, so these um, ISO 15.11.8 and DINSPEC protocols, they're basically like XML-based protocols um, that you can use to talk with the car. So you get much more information from the vehicle, like how many kilowatt hours it needs to actually fulfill its uh, charging target or how big the battery is so you can estimate like the state of charge of the vehicle. Um, this stack is then like a completely separate module that you um, can load or leave it out even completely. Uh, when you do that, you end up with a basic AC charger. But if you decide to load it, um, you can also like implement a DC charger because DC is basically um, completely based on these ISO and DSPEC protocols. And yeah, um, underneath this uh, charging uh, core layer, we have a simple hardware abstraction layer. Um, this is a couple of modules uh, and we try to make this interface yeah, as easy as possible so it's quite easy to port to new hardware and um, yeah, a simple example would be if you want to build like a really simple charging station what you just need to do is uh, write a small driver that does all of this PWM stuff so you can set the correct duty cycle and maybe click some relays and that's pretty much all that you need to build like a really basic uh, AC charger. And yeah, if you then need some more hardware abstraction, like for power meters, etc., yeah, you can also do this in the hardware abstraction layer here. Um, but the good news is if you use like commonly available hardware, um, yeah, then most of the work is probably already done or you can, um, yeah, use a driver module that we already have and just modify it a little bit for your use case. So now, um, looking towards um, the cloud communication, um, for like Pete said earlier, if you wanna do some remote management of your stations or you wanna do billing, um, you kinda need this. So we also provide a uh, OCPP 1.6 JSON implementation. And um, yeah, a lot of effort went into this uh, implementation to make it as um, standard compliant as possible. We uh, verified this with a lot of um, commercial backends, but also with the official protocol testing tool from the Open Charge Alliance. And uh, yeah, we also wrote our own tool um, to integrate it a lot into our uh, simulated uh, charging session um, tooling and we'll release that in the coming weeks. Um, yeah, and I think um, we actually might have the most feature complete uh, open source implementation of OCPP 1.6 available um, with like all the optional profiles and the security extensions. Um, and OCPP 2.0 support is also in the pipeline, but yeah, there's no complete roadmap to get there yet. All right, another uh, important uh, thing is the energy management. Um, here you can use a very simpler uh, mechanism than the one that I showed you earlier um, for configuring the internals of the charging station. Here you can use it to basically model the externals of the charging station. So um, here on, on the left side, you see a 40 amp fuse, which is kind of the representation for 
um, a grid connection point, and um, there you can add some, yeah, some side modules like a power meter, so Everest knows about the power consumption at this grid connection point, or if you have a, um, if you have a contract, a power contract with your electricity supplier that gives you um, different pricing at different times of the day, you can also do it, uh, add a module for price forecasting here. And um, from here on out, you can then start to model out the, uh, yeah, the power distribution grid of, of your house. So uh, on the top right, you, you see a f a 16 amp fuse and two EVSEs, like two charging stations connected to it, that are also both able to draw 16 amps each. So you won't be able to run them at full capacity without blowing this fuse, so you definitely need some form of energy management here. And then um, on the further right, we have a few uh, example cars, like the first one just needs to leave as soon as possible and wants to charge as much as it can. And like the second one, I don't know, wants to leave at 7 a.m. in the morning and wants to charge as cheaply as possible. And if you then, um, yeah, if you then try to add some solar in the mix in the bottom with like a solar forecast where you know that, yeah, some sometime in the afternoon you might have a uh, very yeah, few hours of sunshine, you might want to uh, schedule this car uh, so it charges, uh, I don't know, between 2 and 4 p.m. and, um, I don't know, do the rest of the charging in the night when it becomes uh, cheap again. Yeah, and um, once you have all of this information, we can then uh, run a whole global optimizer over this tree and, yeah, get a um, solution that kind of takes all of these charging goals of the different cars uh, into, into account and um, also takes all the restrictions that we have into account and makes sure that we, for example, don't really uh, blow any fuses or something like that. Um, this also gets a lot more interesting, like Pete also mentioned in the beginning, uh, when we have um, yeah, wide support for bidirectional charging, because then we can do things like, uh, I don't know, use a car as a dump solar load, and then maybe try to sell the energy that's in that car at a later date or something like that. But this is a part that's like under like heavy development right now. So, and for chargers that have a display connected to them. We also built like a little uh, display app that you can run on the charger, which just, yeah, shows you all the important information that you need. This is also under, um, yeah, under heavy development at the moment, and we're going to release the source code to that in, I think, the coming weeks as well. So, um, we also have a complete software in the loop simulation. So, for all of the hardware drivers that we have, we also have a complete software simulation tool available, so you can run the whole Everest stack on your laptop without needing a charging station or a car. Um, so you can just, I don't know, load a simulated car module, run that, and simulate a whole charging session from plugging in the car until uh, it plugs out again, and even, I don't know, connect that to your OCPP backend service. This um, simulation also has support for ISO 15.11.8 uh, software in the loop simulation and uh, yeah, makes it really convenient to develop Everest and run it on your, on your machine without even needing hardware. As you might have seen uh, from the screenshot earlier and from this one, um, internally we use a lot of Node-RED to build some smaller uh, development UIs and that is really convenient because it connects fairly easily to MQTT and then you can just, uh, I don't know, use it to build really simple dev UIs, add some, some graphs to it and uh, yeah, visualize things whilst you're developing. And yeah, if this sounded interesting to you, um, we do have all of our code on GitHub, um, but we also have a weekly developer sync meeting, um, which is on Tuesdays at uh, 10 a.m. Central European Summer Time. Uh, I mean, we're based in Germany, so um, it's quite convenient for us. Um, but this is open to the public, so you can show up there. 
uh, if you want to ask some questions. Um, but we also have a technical steering committee meeting uh, for Everest, which is going on uh, at a monthly at a monthly rate. I think on every fourth Tuesday, uh, Thursday, and the next one is uh, pretty much in exactly a week from now. Um, yeah, and yeah, we also have a mailing list. We have a channel in the LF Energy Slack, and yeah, if you have any questions. Of course. <laughs> Slides are also, uh, I think, uploaded already. All right, so if you have any questions, uh, we're going to be around for a few more minutes. Um, well, it's running on a few development chargers right now from charger manufacturers. It's also running on our own like development kit. Uh, that our company builds, like, not really for, for selling. Uh, I mean, you can buy it, I think, but it's not meant to be as a consumer device, uh, just more like a technology demonstrator. And, um, yeah, I think I've been charging my car for almost a year with it now. Um, so it's definitely running on some commercial hardware, but I don't think you can buy a charger at the moment where it's running on. But I'm pretty sure you will be able to in, I don't know, a year or two. Yeah, I've just put on the slide uh, where you can see a little bit of the community that, that we have right now. Um, so we are um, able to talk to about, about uh, some projects that we have with some uh, charging station manufacturers. I said, uh, well, I think I told you about Futec uh, and Marl and the Hate Charge. So we are currently working on projects with them, uh, with charges coming up in, in the next year. Um, and also with these uh, component, component suppliers, so ChargeByte is it is former Intec. It is a, it is a German company that um, does um, these charge controllers for the for the chargers. So they are not a charging station manufacturers, but they do the communication controllers, uh, and they are going to like adopt Everest or we integrate them into the Everest project. And they uh, will spend a lot of code uh, and um, will use Everest in the future. So um, a lot of stuff happened there in the last months, um, which is really promising. Um, so, we are uh, not focusing only on the European market on purpose. Um, so, I think, like, I, I, I don't know the protocol really well, but Sunspec is some kind of protocol that is mainly used in the US, and we are not targeting only the European market. Um, I think I mentioned that we uh, are evaluating to work together with Texas Instruments uh, right now um, uh, to work, um, or get, get Everest uh, going on their devices. Um, but they are, that's basically all I can say about that. Yeah. Yeah, that's just to add to that, I mean, um, yeah, I mean, we started this project around like two years ago, and uh, obviously coming from Europe, uh, it's a bit European-centric, but um, it's definitely not something that we only want to have in the European market. We also want to expand into, like, I don't know, United States, Asia uh, with this, because we see the same, uh, yeah, problems and... Uh, opportunities there as well. So um, just to repeat your question, um, like you're working in a, um, in a related field or in the field and um, the problems with um, yeah, industry standards not being like that open uh, is is definitely a bit of a problem, but I mean, for us, it's usually yeah. I mean, we're yeah, then buying the standards and uh, reading them and uh, working on that, and think it's okay to kind of implement uh, all of these things in an open way. Um, so it might not even be much of a problem for um, users of us that they don't need they then don't need the standards. They can just um, yeah use our software. Um, or open source software and don't really have to think about all of these standards. This might be a workaround here, but yeah, it's definitely a bit of a problem that some of these things are under, yeah, 
quite high pay vaults at some times and yeah, hard to access. Especially like for the enthusiast maybe. Um, yeah, I'd say this is something that is not, um, I say, yeah, uh, very high on our list at the moment. Um, but we're definitely uh, working on things like secure boot and doing uh, things with like trusted platform modules uh, to try to lock down some of the hardware. But uh, from a project standpoint, we're focusing mostly like on the the standards implementations and the protocols and some hardware drivers. And usually when you're working with a manufacturer together, they already have some form of ecosystem that you can just uh, integrate uh, with. And um, like I mentioned, we don't really sell uh, chargers. We just sell a development kit. And there doesn't make much sense to have a highly secure platform that nobody can tamper with. Um, this is more something that would then be happening in collaboration with uh, a manufacturer, if they want to do it. Hope that uh, answers your question there. So um, just to recap the question, I mean, you're asking if uh, something, uh, how, how do we see the chances of uh, Wallbox kits being available and uh, Everest running on them, for example? Um, I think that's actually something um, that will happen eventually um, because um, the hardware you actually need to build a, let's say, simple AC charger for the home uh, is really simple and inexpensive. Uh, I mean, you can get away with basically a Raspberry Pi, a relay, and some microcontroller where you run some uh, real-time PWM generation code on, and that's basically all you need. So kits like that uh, would be pretty easily integrated into Everest, but I think we haven't really looked into um, that right now, but certainly in the future. Uh, absolutely. I mean, um, this is something uh, where we also are aware of that there's others uh, in this space working uh, working on it quite quite a lot, and um, so we would love to collaborate in this aspect. And um, nothing of this whole Everest project. I mean, you can run uh, our modules on this uh, framework um, pretty agnostically uh, from anything that is EV charging. I mean, you can probably I don't know. Uh, write some games that uh, work over the framework or something like that. So um, that is actually something that we would really like to do. And uh, if there's some collaboration aspects or some collaboration uh, possibilities, we would really be interested in that. Yeah, to quickly add on to that, the, the energy management part is definitely really interesting. And we know that there are like single companies who do not uh, do anything else but developing such in energy management algorithms and integrate uh, like charging stations and batteries and uh, solar panels into that. Um, but as Kai already mentioned, like the framework that we uh, created is not really stick to EV charging. It can also be used like you know, to run any module that you want. So um, it could be a really nice framework um, also for the energy management as well for different modules for that. Um, we are re really looking into this uh, collaboration with research institutes and, and universities because it's yeah kind of a separated problem that you can really easily like uh, give away to someone uh, who who wants to work on it and um, yeah definitely interesting um, for Everest to develop um, also into that direction but currently we we are uh, uh, focusing on EV charging and there's a lot to do in that sector I hope that we could uh, present it to you in this presentation yeah thank you I think maybe we can fit in one more question. Uh, 
long one. So uh, this is covered by this OSPP uh, protocol that I mentioned. So the, the cloud communication handles. Uh, so when, when you do a charging station, you authorize somehow. So you uh, swipe your RFID card or you have your mobile phone app. You have a contract with your mobility service provider. Um, and then all the transaction related data, like when did you start charging? What was the meter value at the start at the end? Will be transmitted to the backend system and then will be on, the, on your bill uh, of your mobility service provider. And this is all covered uh, by OSPP also in the version, already in the version 1.2, uh, I guess. Uh, I know of OSPP in version 1.5, now it's 1.6 and 2.0 covers a lot more than that. But OSPP was yeah, basically starting with all that, solving that payment and billing problem. Now it's, uh, it has a lot of more features. For example, it, ha it ha has also features to control the, the charge power of your charger. So what all these other interfaces also do and for the en energy management related stuff. Um, but it was usually designed to solve all that monitoring and payment and billing stuff problem. Yeah. And there's another standard out there. Like, I think I forgot to mention it. It's the IEC 633110 or something, which looks like it'll, it'll be a follow-up to OSPP. There's an IEC working group on it. And right now, OSPP is just a de facto standard, but not really a standard, but everyone's using it right now. And maybe we'll, there will be something different in the future, but um, yeah, there's so much to come. And this is why we also think that an open source implementation is so valuable because it doesn't really stop and there's yeah, so much more to come. All right, thank you. <laughs>